Hello, I am Norman Stone, I'm the director of The Most Reluctant Convert, the story of C.S. Lewis and his struggle to faith. And I'm on Pints with Jack. Weston, Weston, he gasped. What is it? It's not the moon, not that size. It can't be, can it? No, replied Weston. It's the earth. This is Pints with Jack, Season 6, Episode 5. Rocket Man. Out of the Silent Planet, Chapters 3 and 4. Welcome everyone. Here on Pints with Jack, we're reading our way through the works of C.S. Lewis. I'm David, and I'm joined by my co-hosts Andrew and Matt. This season we find ourselves among the stars, reading through the first of C.S. Lewis's science fiction trilogy, Out of the Silent Planet. In the past couple of episodes, we've just covered one chapter at a time, but today we begin to pick up the pace. We're going to be covering two chapters, and in chapters three and four, we discover what interplanetary travel is like through the eyes of Elwyn Ransom. And since Lewis doesn't give his chapters any names, this season we're naming each episode after a movie title. And since in today's chapter, Ransom is on a flying vessel to some unknown planet, I thought we'd call this one Rocket Man, after the 2019 biopic about Elton John named after the same song, which has an amazing legendary cover by the Mr. William Shatner. <laughs> Gentlemen, welcome to the Rocket Man episode. Welcome. Good to see you guys. Happy New Year. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Happy New Year. What'd you guys do? Uh, I worked on a sermon. <laughs> Got to Good. preach on the holy name on y- yesterday. Um, yesterday? Is it Monday? It is. Um, so yes, worked on a sermon, and we were just back from um, from a week celebrating Christi- uh, Christmas with Kristen's family, and we're going back there for a, a twelfth night party. So lovely, yep. yeah. I I had dinner with a uh, former guest of the show, Holly Ordway, uh, and my wife. It was actually the first time that we left Alexander before he was in bed asleep, so that was oh. a bit of a watershed for us. So she's yeah. she's got a really good view of the fireworks, which happen. And okay. so we went and watched the fireworks and then have a lovely curry. Oh, very good. I love it. And Matt, what did you do? I worked most of the day. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I didn't do anything exciting. I met up with some That's friends for right. dinner and then I was to bed by 10 o'clock. Um, it was great. So hanging out with us is the most partying you've done. So I am currently drinking some <laughs> spotted cow. <laughs> what are you guys drinking? <laughs> I'm drinking a rum punch. Oh, are you really? Very nice. It's well, left over from what I did not drink New Year's Eve because ah. I didn't really drink. <laughs> well, I'm drinking out of the precious, out of the Barfield decanter. And um, uh, a friend of mine from Lewis Circles, Steve Lassiter, who I think is an occasional listener, um, uh, sent me a bottle of Cal Ila 12, you know, the standard. And so I have poured the whole thing into the decanter. And I'm trying that out, so it's uh, kind of like Macallan 12 is is Matt's standard. This is mine. Although I have mm. been dipping into gins lately and uh, enjoyed a lovely gin and tonic with some Hendrix the last couple of nights. <laughs> but here we go. Well, since our protagonist learns new language in this book, this season we're saying cheers in a different language. And today we're going to be doing it in Arabic, which is Saha. Okay. Well... Uh, Today, we are toasting our upper tier supporter, Tim Taylor. Tim, may the beginning of this year find you blessed, full of challenges that require you leaning on the Lord to to, to meet them, and uh, full of blessings for for all the good things that he surrounds you with in this life. So to Tim Taylor, Saha. 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 And I'd also like to toast Mrs. Rempel. I saw on Instagram that she bought her husband, Darnell, a Pints of Jack glass for Christmas. So yes. to amazing wives, such as Mrs. <laughs> Rempel. <laughs> yes, to Mrs. Rempel. Cheers. Saha. Saha. <laughs> Saha. <laughs> well, before we begin, I have a quick addendum to an earlier episode. All the way back in episode one, we read the book's dedication to Warney Lewis, who Jack describes mm-hmm. as a lifelong critic of the space and time story. And I asked what this meant exactly. Uh, our discussion was a little inconclusive, so I reached out to former guest of the show, Dr. Don W. King, whose book on Warney Lewis, 
has just been released. I received my copy on Christmas Day. And so is Andrew. He's waving it in front of his camera. I'm sorry. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. You guys can get my copy. I've got my personalized inscribed copy. Uh, So do I, but I don't need to brag about it. I feel highly left out right now, guys. (laughs) I feel highly left out. Yes. Well, well, we can't all be as secure as you. And what did Don say? Well, I sent him an email and I asked him about Warney's relationship with science fiction. And here's how he responded. Warney likes sci-fi, but with the caveat that things not get bogged down in scientific technicalities of the story. The same reservation that Jack had. And Dr. King then quotes from an unpublished excerpt from Warney's diary, where he talks about a section in an Arthur C. Clarke book, where he describes the technological operation of some sci-fi technology. And he says, it's just a tiresome interruption in a first-class story. I don't want to be told how the damn thing worked, merely that it did. Hmm. So we now have our answer. Warney was definitely a sci-fi fan, but he didn't like it when things got bogged down in explanations and technobabble. Well, and I think that um, by a lifelong critic, I think that um, Lewis probably, in in addition to that, meant you know, kind of a lifelong admirer and somebody who read critically, read with some read with some insight um, hmm. uh, what was going on. Uh, speaking of Arthur C. Clarke, uh, Clarke asked Lewis to be uh, to come and address the British Interplanetary Society. Um, and Lewis refused because the, the the BIS was interested in colonizing space, and Lewis thought space travel was an Ill, ill-advised. And but uh, Arthur Clarke also knew Joy Davidman, and they were in some of the same literary circles together um, uh, in in London when she lived there. And there's actually a book of the correspondence between Clarke and Lewis called "From Narnia to a Space Odyssey." Hmm. And so, yeah, there's some close connection with all of these. Well, turning to Out of the Silent Planet, here is my 100-word summary of the story so far. Philologist Elwyn Ransom was on a solo walking holiday in a remote area when he met a lady who sent him on an errand to a house nearby to request that her son be sent home. At the house, Ransom discovers an old school friend, Dick Devine, and his colleague, Professor Weston. Following an invitation to refreshments, he enters the home, but his drink is drugged. While not out, he has a strange dream, and returning to consciousness sometime later, he tries to escape, but the two men overpower him, knocking him out once more. So that's where we left the story last time. So let's now turn to chapter three. And in this chapter, Ransom wakes up on a bed. He's bruised, he's got a pounding headache, and he looks around and the room around him is small and hot and dark. Uh, And he can see the night sky through a skylight. And he then witnesses a large orb appear in the skylight and begins to wonder if he's having problems with his vision. Regardless, he strips off some of his clothes due to the heat and begins to explore the room. So, gents, where does Ransom initially think he is? Well, he thinks he might, he may be crazy. (laughs) <laughs> um, and he begins to doubt his senses, and this is really Im- important. Um, I actually have subtitled this chapter "Realization, Reason, and Vision." So um, it said it was directed his to his attention that the fact that the room, if it was a room, and elsewhere, um, the light of the huge moon, if it was a moon, and so he's really uncertain and uncertain as to whether or not he can even trust his own senses. Um, which I think is pretty significant. He also comes to the wrong conclusions. Like he he instantly concluded that they had put him in an outhouse behind their furnace. Well, Mm. wrong. Um, (laughs) So he's very disoriented and is not sure what he can trust. And I love that. I love that he has to try to figure out how to think about things, both here um, where he is, and then when he finally arrives on Malacandra, um, he goes through this kind of revolution of how to think about. It's it's an ep- epistemological challenge for him, hmm. which is, I'm sure, what Matt was about to say. I'm sorry to steal your thunder. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was is is David was saying that, and I was looking at the uh, the the first paragraph again. What jumped out to me, and when I read this, was just the the language we've talked about this dr glyer does in the episode too that when i interviewed her of of just the uh 
just the poeticness of the language, but just how direct, distinct, how vivid it is. And this one, that part that it said, the frosty night was pulsating with brightness as with some unbearable pain or pleasure clustered mm-hmm. in pathless and countless multitudes, dreamlike in clarity, blazing in perfect blackness. The stars seized all his attention, troubled him, excited him, and drew him up to a sitting position. I won't go too far with that other than to say it seems like there's there's a life like nature to what mm-hmm. he's witnessing. Like he's mm-hmm. he's describing it much more than just Oh, it's X, Y, Z. It's like there seems to be some sort of livingness to that description. Something very tangible. Absolutely. I wrote down, I underlined that same passage and I wrote down the numinous. Um, So he's in the presence of something really big and really impressive. And um, he kind of has to expand his soul. And I think that's one of Lewis's undergirding notions is that space is not dull and lifeless. Um, But like you said, it's full of life. Um, and even Weston later on in chapter four kind of admits the same thing. Um, and that's one of the things Lewis is looking at the spiritual ramifications of space travel. And he wants to deal with the idea that this isn't just cold, dark, lifeless space. In fact, space mm-hmm. is not the word for it at all. What you had mentioned, um, he was very disoriented mm-hmm. and that that's probably and confused. And that's probably significant, I think was the word you used, Andrew. And I wonder if that's just sort of representative of his worldview is kind of confused, disoriented right now as he's in this stuff is just starting to change from what he was expecting. Still very Mm. early. He doesn't even know where he is yet, but I wonder if that's all related to that same theme. I think we're definitely going to see another time in this book fairly soon where Ransom is just trying to make sense of his senses. So I think that's actually a repeated mm-hmm. motif throughout. But in this particular passage, motif. and that was actually going to be my next question, so we're on it now. Not only is he in the presence of something beautiful, it's also changing him. The line in the text is, he was recovering rapidly and even beginning to feel an unnatural lightness of heart and not disagreeable excitement. So what he is seeing is starting to change, or I think Dr. Ward would say influence him. Mm-hmm. Now, after... Marveling at the stars, he sees this orb of light pass across the skylight. What does he think it is initially? (laughs) The moon. It's a line straight out of Star Wars. (laughs) Say it, Andrew. It's that moon there. That's no moon. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, David, why why didn't you feel like, you know, say it, Matthew? Because you said the first part and I was teeing it up for Andrew. (laughs) We, 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 <laughs> and when we when we when we tee things up, we pass them around our friends. Yes, it's, I appreciate it's, you. It's European I appreciate football. That. It's it's what you do. You know, they have loads loads of 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 highlights of people making perfect passes that never result in goals. And you know, football fans love that. Well, well that happened in the Michigan game. Glory hogs <laughs> like to like to hold on to the ball. We prefer to give it away. I suppose we're, yes. we're, we're just a more gen, a gen, few generous those, people. To be yeah, everybody but Americans. <laughs> I'm not going to say another word. Uh, okay, so he sees this orb. He thinks it's the moon. And now there's additional light. And he begins to explore the mm-hmm. room. What does he discover? Well, he discovers uh, kind of two senses of light. Um, so there's this light coming in that feels very lifelike. There's also this lightness of body. And um, I think here Lewis is quoting McDonald. There's kind of a pun. Um, McDonald has a sh- has a short story called "The Light Princess," mm-hmm. and she's light because she doesn't weigh very much. Um, uh, Hitchcock has got this delightful little story about an obese person who um, wishes that they were lighter, and so she they get they get their wish, and and the person is lighter, but they're still as fat as ever they were, but they float up to the ceiling. You know, and so there's this kind of, um, but he feels this unnatural lightness of heart and not disagreeable excitement. And so there's this sense of the numinous, there's this kind of thrill and um, you get it a little bit um, when you explore worlds, you, you get it with Diggory and the magician's nephew. And when he's there and he realizes that all the pools are, are way portals to another world, he says, just think of what another world might mean. You might find anything, anything. And then uh, you, you find it with, um, with Peter when, when the Pevensies go to the, 
uh, go to Professor Kirk's house. He said, that old chap will let us do anything that we like. And so there's this there's this sense of incredible possibility. And Lewis was interested in space travel because it allowed us into a kind of completely different emotional, spiritual economy than the one that we normally have. And so there's this sense of really kind of crossing a boundary into the unknown. And that's part of why Warney didn't like a lot of science fiction, because it was just mechanical. Lewis actually writes about it. We'll talk about that in the next chapter. But he writes about it um, in his essay on sci-fi, uh, on science fiction. Um, so we'll talk about that later. But there's this kind of possibility that he's that he's experiencing. Am I correct if I remember it's, it's describing the walls as somewhat sloped outwards? Mm -hmm. Like a wheelbarrow. Yeah. Yeah. So they're they're rounded. Yeah. Is he attempting to be representative of that that medieval idea of the cosmos with the earth as like the center and everything goes out? You think that's trying to have a similar type of feel with that, or just coincidental that it if you were to draw the medieval cosmos, it would look an outward slope from the earth in a very wheelbarrow shape. What do you think, David? I think I'd put it down to much more mundane elements of the shape of the ship. The ship itself, we're going to find out, is a sphere. And so mm -hmm. that means it's basically two concentric spheres. And so if you are in one of the, if you are lying down on the inner sphere looking up, the walls are naturally going to be, look like they're sloping outwards. Well, that's no fun. Now, the very fact that he's traveling in a sphere, that I think is a hint, is a nod to the planets. Sure. It's also, I think, as science, scientific and technological as Lewis gets, you know, he's talking about gravity being down. And I couldn't help but think of Ender's game, where Ender's big revelation about the, you know, the, the, the room where they have their battles is that the center is always down. And I wonder maybe if, if Orson Scott Card didn't get it from this. Um, but it's Lewis, I think, showing some awareness of how the technolo technology and the physics of it all work, that the gravitational center that, um, like McDonald says, a story is a little world of one's own. And the spaceship, too, is a little world where down is towards the center, which is the same as, as, our, as our planet. So, yeah, I had never thought about it being a nod to the spaceship being a little world, a little planet. But that's, I think that's a great insight, David. And it's a good question, Pat. And as for Lewis's attempts to be scientific, we're going to have Jimmy Aiken coming on the show once we finish the book, because he has uh, some uh, points of interest that he thinks uh, are worth discussing where Lewis gets a little bit of physics wrong. But we'll get to that Probably eventually. So. <laughs> <laughs> Having never taken physics, I, I think neither, neither we nor Lewis should be surprised. <laughs> exactly. Happens. Yeah. Okay. So he's in this small, weirdly shaped room. Uh, he then investigates the walls, discovers they aren't actually sloping. He tries to get up and then finds himself flung against the skylight and then dumped on the floor. So something weird is happening with gravity. He's actually worried he might be a ghost. And he also notices that the walls and ceiling, they're made of some metal and they're vibrating. And uh, he can also hear something hitting the ceiling. Uh, and so he wonders, might he be on some sort of airship? And, and, as you mentioned earlier, Andrew, he's got this real sort of mixed emotion. Um, the text says, Ransom was by now thoroughly frightened, not the prosaic fright that a man suffers in war, but the heady, bounding kind of fear that he was that was hardly distinguishable from general excitement. He was, po pose, he was poised on a sort of emotional watershed from which he felt he might at any moment pass either into delirious terror or into an ecstasy of joy. That's a word yeah. to conjure with in the Lewis lexicon. It is. And he's he's on the trail of of the numinous. And so maybe even a delicious terror or an ecstasy of joy. Uh, Lewis elsewhere talks about the different kinds of fear and the numinous or the fear of the Lord is, um, Lewis uses the example, if you tell a man that there's a tiger in the next room or tell him that there's a ghost in the next room, they'll respond, he'll respond with terror, but of completely different kinds of terror. <laughs> And so I think it's this latter kind. And although he's very befuddled and has no idea where he is, he really does, I think, sense that there's something spiritual, there's something larger, there's something um, galactic or um, you know, universal even happening here. And I think that that 
um, can be can be linked to to Ransom's Christianity. He's used to thinking about realities that we cannot see or hear or touch or feel, like Screwtape says. And so he's getting the sense that there's something else going on here and that there are spiritual forces at play. And we know that this was part of Lewis's goal as well. He wanted to look at the spiritual am- uh, implications of space travel. Hmm. And Ransom begins to realize that the shining orb that he can see in the skylight can't possibly be the moon. And as he's thinking about this, Professor Weston enters and reveals the truth to a very terrified Ransom. So first of all, how does he conclude that the orb can't possibly be the moon? It's size. Yeah, it's too big. (laughs) He also remembers that it had been a moonless night when he was walking from Natterby. And even it didn't (laughs) look quite right. It, there, he said there's no man in the moon, so there's no, there's no, the, the texture, the shape didn't look right to him. Right. And uh, which tells us, and this is typical and it's frustrating and it's challenging about Lewis, Ransom's memory of what happened in previous chapters is working better than ours because I completely <laughs> forgot that it was a moonless night. And that's part of what I mean when I say that Lewis taught me to read, that Ransom remembered, if you go back and look in chapter two, it's clear, it's right there. And so Lewis expects us to attend very carefully to the details of his story. And of course, when we do, I think we're richly rewarded. So it's a good lesson of how to read as well. Yeah, and Lewis said himself that he would read each book multiple times. First of all, just to sort of orient himself and just get a sense of the characters and the events. And then he would go back and read much more carefully. And I think you would get that on a repeat reading. Now, I think if one of my captors entered the room unarmed, I'd attack him. But how does Ransom respond? <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, I'm leaving that in. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> I love it. Well, I mean, it says he has no reproach, no demand for an explanation, rose to Ransom's lips or even to his mind. But Why? Why doesn't he do that? I I would have thought that that would have been a very obvious thing to do. What is it that's stopping him? I'd imagine it's a combination of as much as they've betrayed him, he does know them. So there's not a foreignness to them. Um, And then potentially he's still disoriented a little bit. And so he's confused, disoriented. And it's just maybe the, the, um, the sight of the familiar in a very unfamiliar environment. Well, and the comfort of another human, um, Mm -hmm. he mentions in the passage, right? Just having somebody else there. We also realize that Ransom is relatively sedentary. You know, he works in English. He works in language. In the second book, there's a big big question about whether or not he should should physically fight. And he's not a a man in a job that, that calls for that kind of physical exertion. And so... Um, he leads with his head. And I think that maybe his head needs to be more connected uh, with his senses. And that hasn't happened yet, for sure. Now, as I said, Weston drops the bombshell as to the identification of that orb. The fact it's not the moon, it's the Earth. How could Ransom possibly confuse the moon with the Earth? Because the two things look nothing alike. They look nothing alike to us who have seen loads of pictures of them right? Mm. This is 1937 that he's writing this. Yeah, published in 38, Mm -hmm. right? But written probably before. And so there are no, uh, Soyuz is still 20 20 years away or so, or Mm -hmm. the first, you know, the first of the, uh, of the, uh, the orbiting, you know, satellites and things. I'll put a link in the show notes. I I went looking for the various pictures of the Earth that we had through the, the subsequent decades. And mm. we don't actually get our first partial image of Earth until October 24th, 1946. And honestly, okay. the, the only really clear ones begin in the mid-60s. But mm-hmm. I, I did chuckle to myself when I first puzzled over that and then went and had a look. And it's like, it's we know what the Earth looks like. It's kind of funny to think that for most of human history, people didn't know what the earth looked like kind of like people didn't know what they looked like before the invention of the mirror they sort of had a Mm -hmm. uh, a they could look in shiny surfaces but they would always be imperfect and that's part of what i think makes the book so remarkable that it still holds up because lewis is in a completely different imaginative space than we are 
I mean, Lewis is thinking about this from the 30s when we're still a decade away from um, from our first image of outer space. And so the the idea that there were there were people in the moon, the the idea that there was could be oxygen everywhere. I mean, the imaginative landscape that's occupying science fiction writers is completely different. Nevertheless, this book still works, and I think that that's partly because he doesn't deal with the technological and the you know the the engineering of it and the physics of it, but he's interested <laughs> in the perspective and that that whole thing. And 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 listeners, keep an eye out for seeing. Because one of Lewis's purposes in all of his writing is for us to see clearly. And part of what he's doing right now is showing what happens when somebody is taken out of their context and how does he see, how can he trust his his vision and his insight and what kinds of seeing uh, can take place. This is also Lewis's very first fiction. He's written poetry, even narrative poetry, but this is his first novel. And the fact that so many of his later themes, Until We Have Faces, and everywhere else, <laughs> are there, I think is remarkable, especially because Lewis is not writing this as a famous writer. This is one of the first things that he's ever published, and he doesn't have his reputation. This is like listening to the first demo on the some ob, you know abstract studio some some offbeat studio from your favorite band and going oh i can see how the fully developed creative work comes from this but this is the earliest earliest stuff and that's part of why this is such an adventure to read hmm. Since we just drunk referring to Till We Have Faces, I want to slip in something that I thought of earlier, but I didn't want to say because then we would have to drink. Uh, this is also a book where we have an unreliable narrator, but he's unreliable not because of his self-delusion, but because he very often doesn't actually even know what he's looking at. Yes, and there's a, there are two levels of unreliable narrator. So Ransom can't trust his senses right now, but then later on, Lewis, the Lewis character who reports what Ransom says, is also kind of unreliable. He's lying to us. He says that this is a story, and if I put it out as a novel, people may believe it. And the real breakdown, Lewis actually makes a huge mistake. He says... Well, hang so, on, hang on, hang on. Should we save that until we get to that point? We should probably. We yeah. should probably. Yes. <laughs> well, let, let's go on to chapter four, because we ended the last chapter with this revelation that... Ransom is no longer on Earth. He's looking at it. Mm -hmm. And as we begin this new chapter, chapter four, the terrified Ransom begins to ask Professor Weston lots and lots of questions. Before we get to his specific questions, how does Ransom respond to the knowledge that he's now on a spaceship? Well, I mean, one of the primary responses that he has right now is fear of varying different degrees. Um, mm. And he's out of his mind. It's ecstatic, almost. It's this otherworldly or out-of-body experience, and he's terrified. Um, and so we see a couple of different kinds of fear happening, and we'll see that when he lands, too, on Malagandra. Um, and as he sorts through his fear, and he reasons his way through fear, and that, that brings us to another real Lewisian theme, that what we think about what we feel is much more important in some ways than what we feel about what we think. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And Andrew, it stuck out to me too that that fear, it said he didn't even know he was afraid of, which mm -hmm. fits with a theme that we've somewhat talked about this, these preconceived notions and fears that we have of space before they will slowly be transformed. And David, mm -hmm. you've already mentioned the word transform, and I think we're actually going to see a little bit more of that later in this chapter of how he is slowly being transformed. And so here you have a state where it's like he doesn't even know he's afraid of, it's just this fear. And remember, Lewis is really trying to kind of fight with the prevalent sense of one of the prevalent themes and senses of science fiction, that we're either presented with aliens that are so powerful that they could wipe us mm -hmm. out with a single, you know, a single stroke, or aliens that are so um, stupid and servile that we could completely dominate them. And that's part of what Weston and Divine want to do is this kind of 
this interplanetary, interstellar domination. And Lewis is pushing back against that and saying, hey, what if we found intelligences that were roughly equal with our own and life forms that are very different, but working with some similar kind of economy? And so that's another real revolutionary um, move in, in Lewis's, in, certainly his science fiction. Hmm. Now, Ransom demands an explanation as to why he's being kidnapped, and he asks lots of questions. How would you describe Weston's attitude in response to Ransom's questioning? <laughs> it was it was so dismissive. Like, I don't know if it's because he has this air of arrogance that this cause is so great and so big. Like, it's just and he's so above him in an intellect and worldview and philosophy, but like... It was just kind of laughing. Oh, fine. I'll just do this to shut you up and to, to make you be quiet. And let's not waste oxygen on these kind of questions and stuff. We only have so much. And I'll just tell you what you need to know. Yeah. And we'll find out too, you know, his dismissive attitude about um, Ransom's education, you know, mm -hmm. and, and he's <laughs> yeah. so consumed by his scientism. And so human is not nearly as important to him as humanity and humanity as he defines it. Mm. I have in my mind when I'm reading this section, Sheldon Cooper from The Big Bang Theory, uh, when, when he's <laughs> talking, show, when he's talking yeah. with his friends, one of whom is only an engineer. And when this engineer says something very intelligent, he goes, oh, please, you don't even have a PhD. It, it, it's, it's very clear as to what he values. I, I would describe it as bored resignation. He says, you know, I, I suppose it will save trouble if I deal with these questions at once instead of leaving you to pester us with them every hour for the next month. He's basically treating him like a child. And he even says that it's pointless trying to explain some things, such as how the ship works, because he couldn't possibly understand. Mm -hmm. And I, this is why I jumped in with Dr. King's explanation about what Warney liked and didn't like about science fiction, because it actually very neatly plays into what his brother likes. You know, you can imagine Warney reading this as he's asking, you know, how does all of this work? And he's going, oh, what's Jack going to do? And it's like, nope, you wouldn't understand. Let's move on. And so that would have made him happy and probably like the book a little more. You know, that's that's something that is going to come up a bit. And I don't want to jump ahead, but that theme, because it, it stuck out to me a little bit as I was listening to some of the uh, audio books on the resources. But it, the idea that scientism is just naturally superior in many ways. So this is one example where we're seeing this, but it's also going to come when Ransom is quite confused by what appears to be the morality of the local inhabitants. And just by assuming they're not as scientifically advanced, thus they shouldn't be as morally good. Well, that that doesn't necessarily follow. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just that that theme itself, this is one example of it. We'll see a few others. Just keep it in the back of our minds. So I also recommend, especially if you want to do some extra reading, um, Lewis's uh, book of other worlds, mm -hmm. um, essays and stories has the essay I mentioned earlier in the episode on science fiction. And in it, Lewis very helpfully describes three different categories of science fiction stories. And the first he describes as science fiction as backdrop. So, the only reason for space travel is to give some ex some bizarre, exotic backdrop to the same old soap opera type stories that we already see. And he excoriates those. He hates those. Um, that you're going to go travel millions of miles and have the same old tired love stories or jealousy stories or whatever. So the second is science fiction as engineering stories. And this is what's going on. He's not interested in the hows, the technical part of how do you do the space travel and how do you do all of this. It's in other, in some ways, the same thing as this kind of backdrop story. It's the the mechanics of it are what enlighten people or or what excite people, writers of science fiction. And if we think back on the sci-fi that we've written, we can start to categorize them. And Lewis is interested in the third category, which is the speculative. And so um, it's and it's very similar to his purpose of Narnia. Narnia is a supposal. It's a what if there were a world like this? 
So what if we were to travel to Mars and meet the natives of Mars? What would their spirituality be like? What would their emotional world be like? How would their mental processes be? And the speculative is where Lewis kind of puts his money for you know the science fiction stories, and that's what he's doing here. He, of course, gives a great deal of credit to David Lindsay's uh, Voyage to Arcturus as being one of the first books that he found that looked at the speculative um, implications of space travel. And that's part of what's going on here. So returning to the story, where does Weston say they're going? Melancontra, a star. Well, he doesn't say. He doesn't say where they're going. He wants to keep it secret. <laughs> and when Ransom says, are we going to another star? He's like, oh, you're an idiot. Even you can figure out that that, that kind of space travel, you know, is impossible. We'll be there in 28 days. Um, so they kind of circle around on planet, although Ransom, even as a philologist, is a little imprecise with his language, right? This planet or this star or wherever it is. Mm -hmm. um, and he becomes increasingly more more precise about, about what the what's and the where's and the language for it. I am going to jump to his defense, though, because I think it's a bit unfair to chide him for even mentioning a star when five minutes ago, Ransom thought space travel was impossible. So now he suddenly found out it's, it's possible. Why not leave the solar system? And also, what does he mean by a star, mm -hmm. right? Um, does he just mean one of the heavenly bodies? Because I'm not sure, um, it, it may be worth looking up. Were they able to, well, sure, of course, they were able to distinguish in the sky, which were the planets and which were the stars. Mm -hmm. But somebody not trained in those fields wouldn't be able to really tell. But even then... What do we say in scripture, which is drawing on more ancient traditions? What is the morning star? Hmm. The morning star is Ungat. <laughs> <laughs> to everyone else, it's Venus. <laughs> yeah, it's Aphrodite, it's Venus. And that's actually one of the new connections that I'm working on is because Lewis mentions the morning star. He says, ask for the morning star and take thrown in your earthly loves. And so this idea of the morning star and Venus is increasingly central to, to Lewis. Um, and of course, he ends up in Venus uh, before long, but we won't get to that book this year. No. Now, Ransom, he discovers that his captors have been to this planet before, and it's kind of hilarious because he responds with disbelief. Again, it's just like given his situation, why disbelieve anything at this point? Uh, but to, <laughs> to his mind, if such a thing had happened, it would be in the papers. You, you get to see very much how conventional his life is. Mm -hmm. But why do you think Weston doesn't want to tell Ransom our name for Malacandra? I never thought of that. Keep it secret. Keep, Keep it, it safe. safe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's some of that. And also, um, we find out later the reason why Ransom is being brought along, the purpose for which they bring him. And so the less information he has, the better. It's also to Weston and Divine's benefit to keep him uncertain, to keep him, you know, guessing, to keep him kind of at odds, and to keep him in fear. And that's part of what happens with with Ransom, too. I, as I was rereading that, I'm like, he's going to find out soon enough. We're eventually figured out. Why not tell him? But it's Weston imposing his power on what mm -hmm. Ransom's going through and helping to define Ransom's experience. Fortunately, Weston isn't the only force at work. There's the force of the community that he finds on Malacandra, and there's also the force of Maladil, blessed be he. There's the force of God working on, on, on Ransom's life. But it's to their benefit to kind of keep him in the, in, in the dark about all of this, <laughs> ironically. Yeah. In, in my book, I wrote next to that, is he annoyed? Is he just lazy? Or does he want to hold something over him and make him feel stupid? Because one thing we know about Weston is that he feels far superior. He even mm -hmm. uh, dishes out the line, I don't think we have much to fear from your scientific attainments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there's all of that kind of at work. Next up, Ransom demands to know why he's been abducted and what plans they have for him. And in this conversation, their respective life philosophies come into conflict in the exchange. <laughs> so, Matt, I'm going to be passing this one over to you because I know you've been wanting to talk about this forever. Uh, but before we get to that, 
what explanation does Weston actually give as to why they've abducted Ransom? Well, doesn't he just say that it was not intentional? It was like Ransom's fault. You stumbled into my backyard. You were just kind of there. I mean, it wasn't, if you weren't there, it's, it, this wouldn't be happening. Seems like he's yeah. gaslighting. Victim him. blaming. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And also, if you had minded your own business, you would not be here. But why did I thought about this and I'd never noticed this in previous readings? Why did Ransom, you know, go through the hedge and get to the house? Well, he was practicing charity, mm -hmm. right? He's on a quest. And although he kind of curses his promise to Harry's mother, um, it's a it's it's a kind thing to do. It's a courteous thing to do. It's a Christian thing to do. It's a gentlemanly thing to do. If you had minded your own business, well, his business is to love others. It is to help others. And so he is minding his business, but it's not any kind of business that Weston can really identify with at all. Mm -hmm. Or even slightly understand. Mm -hmm. uh, right. One of the things that Weston says is that um, it almost doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter that we've brought you here because our cause is so supremely important. It's just a necessary evil. He, he says this, My only defense is that small claims must give way to great. You cannot be so small-minded <laughs> as to think that the rights or the life of an individual or of a million individuals are the slightest importance in comparison with this. And when we do our Narnian Chronicle of the season, we're going to hear echoes of several of the antagonists the human versus or humanity human versus humankind that, human that versus idea. humanity right yeah human versus humanity and this i this lofty ideal of what humanity might mean i mean the survival of the species if you and this gets back to mere christianity why is the survival of the species important why is it good that humans survive and what do you mean by good? And good by wh whose standards? And this is where Lewis's poetry on the science fiction trilogy really is helpful. He's like, look, you're the ones responsible for Berg and Belson. You're the ones responsible for Auschwitz and for all kinds of massacres. And if you look at the, at the, at the, the reputation and the history um, of humanity, it's not got a great track record. And why is it so important that we survive and fling this horrible legacy of hatred and racism and abuse and, and power greed? Why, why should we inflict this on another planet, especially if they don't have those things? And so that's one of the questions that I think that was a real going concern and makes Lewis kind of a prophetic voice. You know, if we found intelligent life, why would we assume that ours is the best? And here, I think that although you get charges of colonialism and imperialism, you know, and racism in Lewis, in, you know, Horse and His Boy and other things, I think that those are hollow because Lewis is here really speaking against the mm -hmm. kind of thoughtless imperialism mm -hmm. that his own country is still actively engaged in. And he's, he's thinking about the kingdom of Caesar versus the kingdom of God and, and advocating for the kingdom of God. Whereas Weston and, and Divine are advocating for Caesar's kingdom and the perpetuation of humanity at whatever cost, without even looking at what humanity might mean. Yeah, it's, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. It, yes, it's that philosophy, the at whatever cost. And he rejects this perspective and references vivisection. And we've mentioned it, I think, in the last episode. Uh, but vivisection is the experimenting on live animals. And I think Ransom brings up this example because at the time... People said, well, why wouldn't you do this? We can learn so much. But Ransom and Lewis uh, said, no, we actually have a responsibility here to animals. We can't just do whatever we want, even if we can get some good things out of it. The ends do not justify the means. Mm -hmm. Now, Weston brings their interview to a close, saying that nothing else can really be answered. But their life philosophies have now been compared. How would you describe mm -hmm. Weston so far? Andrew put it really well with the human versus humanity. I mean, Weston's is humanity first, and that trumps humankind. And he went so far as saying he's willing to a million individuals sacrifice for the sake of, of humanity. I mean, that's a big number. This isn't just like one individual. I mean, 
how many of us would actually potentially answer? I mean, there might actually be some people that would be like, oh, one person for a billion, maybe. <laughs> um, even though we know that would not be correct. And he yeah, clearly here. doesn't care about others. And he has a very, very telling line, particularly given what's going to happen in Germany over the next few years. He says, we're about mm -hmm. when they're bringing ransom to this planet, he says, we're just following orders. <laughs> this mm -hmm. is a very mm -hmm. unfortunate turn of phrase, given what's going to happen in Nazi Germany and what people are willing to do because they're just following orders. Right. And then we have to ask ourselves, and I don't want to get ahead of because we'll see that in the future uh, chapters, but he's he's following orders because he's getting something. He's doing it so he can get something in return. Oh, yeah. So like, what is that thing that he's trying to get? I'll just leave it at that. But there's clearly some reason he's following orders because in theory, he could be following orders because he's afraid and he's got a gun to the back of his head. In this case, it's not that. He's doing it for very selfish motivations. Mm -hmm. No, without any question. Um and although, right, it's, you know, we don't know about Hitler yet. There's, Hitler is in some ways a product of the kind of scientific thinking of the age. And Lewis somewhere talks about the idea of progress. And he's always thinking about the philology. Progress comes from gradus gressus, right? Meaning to step, to, you know, to take a step. And progress is moving forward. And, you know, and again, he touches on it in, in mere Christianity and elsewhere. What's the use of stepping forward if the goal is not right? He talks about it in Christianity in the three parts of morality. Mm -hmm. And he fleet. breaks it down, you know, what, yeah, exactly. What's going on inside a person is important. What's going on with the fleet is important. But if they're not headed to the, in the right direction and headed to the right goal on the right map, they're also going to go wrong. And, and although at the, on the surface, Weston's goal of perpetuating humani humanity seems an entirely good one, Lewis is saying, hey, hang on a second, let's look at that. And this is in some ways the beginning of Lewis's at least cultural apologetics to go, hey, we have dismissed the wrong things, we are headed to the wrong things, and we are not thinking carefully about either the rejection or the or the destination and it's the, i mean this is a huge salvo um i think in some ways this book is as much an apologetic work as anything he writes in the 40s as miracles or mere christianity or anything else and in some ways more effective because we're still you know still reading that helpfully and people often pair the abolition of man with the third book in this series that hideous strength but honestly, mm -hmm. you compare mm -hmm. it you compare it an awful lot with Out of the Silent Planet, a lot of the very similar ideas are explored here. Absolutely. Now, Weston takes Ransom to the galley, and Ransom begins to get his bearings on the ship. And he notes the strange experience of walking into the next room, and Weston explains what is happening by explaining how the ship is structured, the idea of these concentric spheres. Uh, is there anything else mm -hmm. you want to say about that before we... Uh, get on to the final section of this chapter. You know what jumped out to me of that was there's one small little bit where he goes, Ransom rose and his captor opened a door. Instantly, the room was flooded with a dazzling golden light, which mm -hmm. completely eclipsed the pale earth light behind him. I think that was that key part. So behind earth, pale, in front, dazzling golden, which is really contrary to that's more the medieval cosmos worldview, contrary to more current worldviews of, oh, the space is just this empty, formless void, and the earth is this really great, wonderful, beautiful thing. So this is really flipping in one sentence that whole thing up on its head. Well, and you also have to keep um, Reverend Dr. Michael Ward's theory in mind. Um, on the first page of the chapter, Ransom says, and what on earth have you kidnapped me for? And the answer clearly is nothing. nothing. <laughs> captured him for nothing on earth and he says oh this is sheer lunacy mm -hmm. but lunacy is, is your 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 philosophy is raving lunacy well that's craziness caused by the moon and so he's getting it wrong again and then um keep the, going <laughs> the, the, the real irony this is great weston says forgotten the sun <laughs> right and in fact ransom is responding correctly to the sun Right? 
and Weston is responding incorrectly to the sun, well, divine is because part of what they're looking for, and I'm sorry for the spoiler alert, but part of what they're looking for on Malacandra is sun's blood, which is gold. And so all they want is the material implications of the of the sun, and they want to bleed it dry. They're materialistic about it. Um, he, yes, Ransom has forgotten the sun, but um, but as we'll as we'll see, Weston and Divine have never come up with an idea of the sun that can meet the good idea that Ransom's has having a spiritual cosmology going on. And so mm-hmm. it's there's these little quips and little little hints that Lewis leaves in here that just also make it brilliant and and satisfying on a careful reread. I love your passion, Andrew. <laughs> this is great stuff. <laughs> okay, so he's explored a little bit of the ship. For those of you that watch Rick and Morty, or at least willing to admit it, this is kind of like Tiny Planet. Uh, but Ransom then changes into a uniform of sorts. And while the two men have breakfast together, he begins to consider life among the stars. So practicalities, what equipment does Weston give Ransom before breakfast? <laughs> he gives him kind of a steel skirt and he gives him some uh some sunglasses but i also found the irony um that the warning at the end of the chapter of hey let's not use up too much oxygen doesn't keep weston from being pompous and holding forth uh, as often as he wants to when i reread this in preparation for our discussion and i pictured in my mind's eye what this would look like my first thought was what would they do if they turned this into a movie they would have to change this a little bit because they would look ridiculous <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah absolutely can't imagine chris pratt in a little you know mithril <laughs> shorts or something <laughs> my eyes um, well lewis yeah. writes very beautifully in a section about the light in the spaceship uh, why do you think he focuses on it so much uh, part of that is perspective you know, is vision. And then I also have a note in my margin about the different cabins. And it made me think of the voyage of the Don Treader. And the voyage of the Don Treader, uh, the the planet, if Michael Ward is right, and he is, he is. Mm-hmm. the planet discussed is the sun. And so while they are in this episode of the of the journey, they're being exposed to the sun. And so, you know, I'd never thought about it before all that extensively, but to think about the influence of the sun that you see in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, Mm -hmm. also the fundamental sin of Caspian and others, um, when they come to Deathwater Island, they're lusting after gold, which is exactly what Divine is lusting after, right? And so, and gold being sun's blood. And so there's this kind of cosmological, and there's this journey that's happening on a vessel. And the only other journey that you see similar is the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And so I think that although Lewis didn't have the Dawn Treader in mind for another decade, um, uh, at least a decade and more, you can start to hear some similarities when Lewis is doing the same, same thing when he writes the Narnias. And there's a transformation in the passengers as well, because in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, they drink the water as it's like pure light. And here, as we're going to find out next time, uh, and we've got the inklings of it already here, that this light is starting to change Ransom himself. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, David, it says right here, his headache was gone. He felt vigilant, courageous, magnanimous, as Mm -hmm. he had seldom felt on earth. I mean, you're already seeing it happen here. And he describes it a little bit earlier, the tyranny of heat and light like this is just Mm -hmm. incredibly palpable i mean tyranny is a strong word Mm -hmm. suggests he couldn't actually resist it actually now that you think about it now that i speak out loud like it's it was so impressed on him he couldn't fight it and the word tyrant comes from a greek word which means the throne inherited by somebody not in the direct line of succession right and so you have tyrants in the Antigone story, right? Creon is a ty- is a Tyrannus. Um, he is not the rightful inheritor. And I he think is a Rex. this I- he is a Rex. Yes. <laughs> um, he is a king. But this tyranny is they're going forth into the realm of the sun, the fields of Arbol. Arbol is sun. They're going, they're sailing through the 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 the, the water of space. 
right, on their ship, but they're doing it for entirely poor motives, bad motives. And so the tyranny of sun and light, I wonder if a, a, a Christian journey to Malakandra would not have a light, you know, or windows that made the light more welcoming. And even though their purpose is evil, um, ransom is a redemptive presence. And that's something I think, listeners, we can take away. Even in difficult situations where we find ourselves, even in non-Christian situations, as Christians, we are light bearers, and our very presence changes the spiritual economy of the enterprise and the room and the vessel. And in some ways, this is what Lewis is getting at. Ransom's presence as a Christian on this very materialistic, even satanic journey acts redemptively. And he's going to understand that the tyranny of light becomes this kind of rightful rule of uh, of of the sun. And so I hadn't noticed it before we, we, we began discussing it, but here's a great, I think, spiritual takeaway that even his presence is going to help to ameliorate the evil of the situation that's entirely around him, even when he's entirely powerless. And that's what we should do. We should also shine like the stars of the heaven as our Lord commands us oh. to. You're really bringing it this episode, Andrew. <laughs> and I would also say that they're encountering something powerful uh, in these rays of light. And I'd actually say there's a little of an echo of the prophet Isaiah, that when he encounters God, he says, woe is me, a man of unclean lips. And an angel comes and takes a, a burning coal and brings it to him and cleanses his lips. And that doesn't sound like anything particularly pleasant, but it is sanctifying. So maybe also how this light is affecting each of the men on the ship might be a little different. So as Weston tells Ransom to stop talking so much, we too must bring our conversation <laughs> to a close and not use up so much oxygen. But do you guys have any final brief thoughts before we wrap up? I just think that he's writing a ripping good story, and I don't think Lewis is necessarily trying to fill it with all of these ph philosophical and spiritual and speculative things. I think he's just writing a story about what would happen if a person like him, an academic in the in in the in the language arts, gets kidnapped and taken to another planet. And what are the spiritual ramifications of what might happen? And he's writing, I think, a, a pretty ripping good tale that even still 80 years and more later, um, are 85 years actually, 85 years this year. Uh, are still having things that, uh, that we can take away with us. And so my hat's off to Lewis again. <laughs> well, I'm going to follow up on that with a quotation that was in the Commonplace Quotes on the Literary Life podcast, which I thought was superb. Hmm. This is from Timothy Rollins. A good story isn't told to make a point. A good story reflects the world God created. The point makes itself. Well, and I think that the point comes through based on the goodness of the writer right? Lewis's Christianity invades his writing because he's a Christian doing the writing, and he has that worldview. Tolkien's Catholicism, he says that the Lord of the Rings is fundamentally Catholic. Um, it comes into the story- Unconsciously at first. Yes, consciously in the revision. It's fundamentally religious and even Catholic. And so the goodness of the writer can't help but spill into the story. So we should have a care about what we, what we read. Um, we should- also, you know, read widely and and entertain lots of different viewpoints, but we should do it kind of like Ransom, you know, being a minority voice, but one that really actually has the truth. And I can't wait to see what happens with Ransom and how he triumphs. Um, even though I've read the story again, I can't wait to see how it develops. <laughs> well, the audience question for this episode is, what would you have done if you were Ransom and woke up on a spaceship? Scream? Fight? Let us know. David's not satisfied with his response. Yeah. I would have put on metal shorts and, <laughs> and worn my sunglasses at night. Um, yes. Sun sunglasses yeah. and a metal skirt is an option. <laughs> well, I hear the call for final drinks. So thanks to all of our listeners, Patreon supporters, and particularly our top tier supporters, Matt, Jake, James, Erica, Marvin, Joelle, Deborah, Amanda, Thomas, Bill, Bud, Shane, Kay, Paul, Kimberly, Gillis, Gary, Stephen, Matt, Kelly, Chris, James, Kate, Peter, David, Angela, and Rowdy. Thanks again to all of our listeners. We pray for you every Tuesday. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please tell a friend. It's not too late to start a little book group and read through this book together.
because as you heard on the last episode of our interregnum, as I was sharing with the Oxford C.S. Lewis Society, everything's just better in a fellowship. Yes. And Plinus, <laughs> I don't even know what that Plinus. was. David, well, you got to leave this in because David I'm allegedly I'm glad that the said- L was there, though. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I do know that was going to be. Please join us. I just said Plenus or something. Okay. David, maybe I don't it's remember a new David. planet that Matt discovered. <laughs> the planet Plenus. <laughs> and David, what did I? He sent me a recording uh, from some previous recording, an audio of some previous recording, and he goes, "What did you say here?" And I re-listened to it. And I go, "I have no idea." <laughs> That's okay. We normally have no idea with on our first. Well, Uh, listeners, please join us next time when we'll continue going further up and further in. Saha. Cheers. Saha.